I'm going to invite you to take your Bibles or your Bible apps and turn to the Gospel of Luke chapter 23. We're continuing our series, uh, Last Words, where we're looking at Jesus' words on the cross, his statements, if you will, in the, in the final moments of his life. While you're finding uh, Luke 23, by the way, um, if you don't have a Bible with you or a Bible app on your device, grab one of the Bibles in the seats around you. Turn to page 1051 and you will find Luke chapter 23. And as always, if you want a Bible, you don't have one, you want to read God's Word, then please take one of these with you. It is our gift to you. We want you to have the Word of God, read the Word of God, because we know if you do that, it will change your life. A uh, couple of things that while you're finding Luke 23, uh, first of all, uh, Robert mentioned the, the Passion Experience, April 7th through the 9th. Uh, this is something that is similar and different from what we've done in the past. A lot of you have been around for a while. You've been a part of the Passion Play. You've seen it. You love it. Uh, you know it. And, and, uh, and this is going to be a little bit different. In fact, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be a Passion Experience because this is far more a worship service than it is a production or a performance. So uh, I hope you're excited about this. Some of you uh, are going to love the changes we made, and some of you won't. Hey, it's just a reality. If you've seen it, you've got an opinion. And, and here's the thing. Uh, it, we're not doing it so that you guys will love it. Okay, I, I'm just saying that, being honest with you. Our mission of Calvary is to lead people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus through the love of his people and the power of his truth. And, and this is an opportunity to do that. And so um, we realized that by doing it on our weekend services, instead of uh, in the middle of the week, less church people will be able to come to it because they'll be going to their own churches. That's okay with us because our target audience is not reaching church people. We want to reach those people that, that are far from God, that, that aren't connected to a church any place. And so I want to encourage you to start thinking about your friends, your neighbors, your coworkers that don't have any church and invite them. That's what the tickets are for. They're just a, a, a way to make it easy for you to invite them. So uh, I want to encourage that because we're, we want to see lives change through that. And then three weeks from this weekend is Easter. You guys all ready for Easter? It's going to happen whether you're ready for it or not. But uh, I, I'm just going to kind of make this observation. We, we're going to expect uh, a ton of guests on Easter Sunday. And, uh, and you know, while there's seats here, uh, we think that it might be really kind of crowded. And so we're going to ask something. We're going to add an extra service on Saturday afternoon. We're going to have a 3.30 and a 5 o'clock service on Saturday, Easter weekend. And, uh, and we're looking for about 50 to 100 people from this service to kind of migrate to, to Saturday. And, and some of you are going like, well, that's not Easter. It is in Jerusalem. <laughs> so, uh, you know, kind of do it, do it early and then, you know, and then invite, your, invite some of your unchurched friends to come to Easter with you on Saturday and take them out on the boat on Sunday and ask them how they liked it. So, uh, you know, just a, just a way of doing it. But uh, we're just recognizing that, that God keeps sending us people and we love that and we want to make a place for them. And so some of you may be called by God. Just ask God if he wants you to do it. Maybe called by God to, to kind of switch for that one weekend as a way of serving him and, and creating some space for those who, uh, uh, who want to come. By the way, if you can't stand it, you have to come on Easter Sunday anyway, uh, then just volunteer to serve in some way. We're going to need help in the nursery, help with the kids, help with the, the, the greeters, whatever, and just say, hey, I want to I wanna help out, and that'd be really cool. So who do you trust? Who do you trust? If you had to give me the names of five to ten people who, uh, that you trust, could you do that? Could you provide those names? Because trust is essential for any relationship. Trust is, is necessary. I want to stare at this. It's going to drive me nuts. So I'm just going to move it back here. Uh, and I trust that uh, Brandon will find it at the end. Uh, if not, yeah, you'll find it. He's sitting right there, so he'll find it. So are you staring at that too, thinking, oh, I should have moved that because uh, I didn't move it? Yeah, anyway. So who do you, if, you, if you had to name five or ten people that, that you trust, could you do that? Because trust is essential for any healthy relationship. Trust is, is that kind of that birthplace of intimacy and joy in our lives. And, and the more trust we have, then the more intimacy we have with our loved ones, the more joy we experience. And so trust is that necessary element. So who do you trust? Do you trust your mechanic? Do you trust your doctor? See, a lot of you like your doctor, but I don't know that you trust him. Because if you trusted him, you'd actually do what they told you. Just a, just a thought. Do you trust your accountant? How about that airline pilot? Do you trust him when you get on the plane? 
Or are you nervous the whole time, you know, kind of freaking out? Uh, do you trust your children? Do you trust your spouse? Do you trust God? You see, today we're looking at one of Jesus' final statements from the cross. And, and literally, it is a statement, uh, actually a prayer of trust. Luke chapter 23 Verses 44 through 46. Now, if you're joining us uh, late, what, what's happened is we've already looked at Jesus, the, the trial. He's been condemned. He's been tortured. He, he's been crucified. And this is late in the journey now uh, on the cross. It was now about the sixth hour, and there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour, while the sun's light failed. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two. And then Jesus, calling out with a loud voice, said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And having said this, he breathed his last. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Jesus trusted his father with his life. Jesus trusted his father with himself completely. He trusted him. Now think about this. This is the same father who sent Jesus into the world to suffer and die on our behalf to pay for our sins. This is the same father who rejected Jesus' plea just hours before in the garden when Jesus prayed, Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. Yet, not my will, but your will be done. This is the same father who, who asked Jesus to, to endure the agony of the cross, physical pain and spiritual pain, because the one who knew no sin became sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God. And yet, even through all of that, Jesus trusted the Father. And, and he issued that statement of trust in God. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. So today, do you trust God? Now, most of us are followers of Jesus. And most of us here already believe that Jesus is the Son of God, the Savior of the world. We believe that he died on the cross to pay for our sins. He was raised from the dead. And, and we've made a commitment to follow Jesus with our lives. And so the easy answer, the church answer is what? Yeah, we trust God. Of course we do. We're trusting God with our death. Right? We're trusting that God has forgiven us of our sins through Jesus. And, and that when we die, we're going to go to heaven. And, and there's going to be a place for us because Jesus said so. And, and by the way, if you're a follower of Christ, that is absolutely true. You can trust Jesus with your death. You can trust him uh, to fulfill his promise that heaven is your home. You're going to get a new body, new life. It's going to last forever. It's going to be better than anything you can imagine in this world. So we trust God to take care of eternity. But until we're in our dying moments, do we trust God? Or really, better yet, will you trust God? I want to ask you four questions. Uh, about trust. And, and really what I hope happens today is you'll just simply look at this and evaluate your life and really figure out where your trust level is with God and, and how that's impacting your relationship with God. Because without trust, you're not going to have a healthy, dynamic, growing love relationship. So first question, will you trust God with wisdom? We trust God with wisdom. Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. A very popular verse. You, you may know the verse even if you don't know where it's found. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will direct your paths. It's a great verse. If we trust God and don't try to figure out life on our own then, and we follow God's wisdom and counsel, he's going to guide your life. And we love this verse. We quote it. We, we put it up in, on our, in our homes, you know, as a, a framed verse. We write it on graduation cards because we think the next generation needs to get this. And generally, um, we ignore the counsel ourselves. You see, if we trust God, we will live according to biblical principles and commands. That's why we encourage you to read this book. That's why we offer this book as a gift to anybody who needs it. Because we know if you read God's word and understand God's wisdom and apply it to your life, your life will be changed for the better. This is God's wisdom. Do you trust him with it? 
Here at Calvary, the way we put it is this. We believe the Bible is the inerrant, inspired word of God that tells us what to believe and how to live. That's God's wisdom. So we've got to read it, and then we've got to actually practice what we read. Put it into practice. So do you trust God with his wisdom when it comes to forgiveness? Because God says in Ephesians chapter 4, be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as in Christ God forgave you. Now, do you trust God enough to forgive the, the heinous acts that have been done to you? The hurt that's been given to you? Do you trust God? Not because that person deserves to be forgiven, but because you trust God's wisdom that forgiveness is going to bless you, that it's going to heal your heart when you let go of the anger, when you let go of the pain, when you let go of the offense and you embrace mercy, that your life is going to be healed and your life is going to have more joy in it because you listen to God's wisdom and you forgave. Do you trust God at the point of serving? You know, we talk about serving all the time here. Philippians chapter 2 says this, do nothing from selfish ambition or empty conceit, but rather with humility of mind, consider others more important than yourself. Do not merely look after your own interests, but also the interests of others. Wow, do you trust God enough to put the priorities of other people ahead of your own selfish needs, your own selfish desires, your own self-interest? I mean, that's hard. You're willing to trust God at that point to do that? Or how about this, out of 1 Thessalonians chapter 4? The Apostle Paul says, this is God's will for you, your sanctification, that you abstain from sexual immorality. That's pretty blunt. God just kind of says, hey, I, 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 my will is for you to be pure in your relationships, which means that, you know, premarital sex is wrong, extramarital sex is wrong, pornography is wrong. It, it's all going to hurt your life. And, and, and so many times we just kind of go, well, you know, God just doesn't understand the world we live in. God just doesn't understand how we're supposed to relate to one another. And that's just the way it is. Really, is it? Or are we making a choice to, you know, reject God's wisdom for our lives? Or how about Romans chapter 12, where the apostle says, rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Have you ever considered how much better your life would be without envy and jealousy poisoning it? Without you always comparing what other people have and, and, and wanting that? And instead just simply celebrating with people when they have success and grieving when they have loss and refusing to respond in kind to the people who attack you? That's God's wisdom. Or do we trust God enough to actually do that and allow him to provide? Or how about 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, where it says, Rejoice always, pray continually, in everything give thanks, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Do you trust God's wisdom enough to refuse to whine and complain about life, about your situations, about circumstances, and to give thanks for God's blessings? Or how about, well, just that subject of love? Because we all know that God wants us to love. We're all, we all, you know, quote it easily, love one another as Christ has loved us. Okay, we get that. We're supposed to love our neighbor as ourself. What about 1 Corinthians 13, 4, where the apostle says, love is patient and love is kind and it does not envy and it does not boast and it is not proud, it is not rude, it is not self-seeking, it is not easily angered, and it keeps no record of wrongs. Do we trust God enough to love like that? You see, we have to decide, are we going to trust God's wisdom? Because trust all begins with God's wisdom. If we're going to trust God, we've got to believe him. And if you believe him, then you'll do what he says because you know that your life's going to be better if you do that. Because if we listen to the Proverbs, it says if we trust in the Lord with all of our heart and we don't lean on our own understanding and if all of our ways we acknowledge him, then what's God going to do? Direct our paths, which leads us to the second question. Will you trust God with your plans? Will you trust God with your plans? Another verse we love to write on graduation cards and encourage young people with, Jeremiah 29, 11. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, to give you hope 
and a future. We love that, don't we? God has a plan for you, a plan to bless you, to give you hope and a future that is awesome. And we have plans for us, don't we? We got plans for our lives, big plans. We know how we want our life to be. We know how we want God to bless us. Can I just share with you a, a real simple truth that you probably already know but maybe haven't admitted yet? Nobody's life turns out like they plan. <laughs> Nobody's does. I guarantee you, nobody plans for tragedies. Nobody plans for accidents. Nobody, absolutely nobody, plans for betrayal. Nobody makes plans for losses. Nobody plans to grieve the loss of their spouse or their child. And yet we live in a broken world that is dominated by sin, the sinful actions of others, ourselves, and, and the just random sin that's out there that poisons this world. And so we experience that, and God redeems our brokenness. God redeems our pain, our losses. God redeems the betrayals, our failures. And he leads us to hope and a future if we trust in his plans, if we follow his plans. Here's what we don't often acknowledge when we quote Jeremiah 29, 11. You know, we love saying, God has plans for you. I know the plans I have for you, plans to prosper you, not to harm you, to give you hope in a future. And we know that he said that to God's people, but here's what we often don't acknowledge. He said that to God's people who had just suffered a terrible military defeat. Their capital city had been destroyed. Their nation had been destroyed. And he's saying this to the people who are captives, who are slaves, who've been moved to a city about a thousand miles away. And they want God to rescue them. And God says this, I'm not going to rescue you. I want you to plant your life there. I want you to build there, your lives there. I want you to give your kids in marriage. I want you to have babies, have grandbabies. Uh, you're going to be here a while. And I know the plans I have for you, plans to prosper you, not to harm you, to give you hope in a future. It's not your plans, it's my plan, says the Lord. So here's my counsel to you. You got plans. Awesome. Bring them to the altar, lay them down before God, and kill them. Go ahead and grieve the loss of them now. It's better that way, because here's the truth. God's plans for your life are better than your plans for your life. God's plans for your life are better than your plans for your life. I know of what I speak. Let me just go ahead and confess a little bit about how just ridiculous and moronic uh, Chad Garrison's plans for his life were. Uh, I came to Calvary as pastor in 1992, and my plan, my brilliant plan, was to be here about three or four years, and, you know, because it's the first church I ever pastored, and make a bunch of mistakes, learn how to do this, and then move to a bigger church in a bigger town. You know, or sometimes I, what I used to say is a real church in a real city. <laughs> see, see how ignorant I was? And, and through the years, there were times when I, I would ask endlessly, God, when are you going to move me? God, where are you going to move me next? You know, what's going to happen next? Why are you doing this, God? When are you going to get me out of here? <laughs> and, and basically, uh, the only thing I did right at that, through that was I just said simply, God, your will be done. I'm not going to do what I want. I'm going to wait for you to act. And God kept me here. And thank God he didn't listen to the moronic, idiotic suggestions of my plans. Because God's plans are so much better. I've had the, the privilege for almost 25 years of, of being the pastor of Calvary and watching God change countless lives and build this wonderful church that I get to be a part of. And, and, and God's plans are better than our plans. I don't care who you are. I've got blessings that I don't deserve because his plan is way better than my plan. I never imagined how good his plans could be. And, and that's true for all of us if we trust God to lead our lives so will you trust God with your plans? Third question. Will you trust God with your money? Will you trust God with your money? Jesus is talking to his disciples, Matthew chapter 6, during the Sermon on the Mount. He says this. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy or where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroy nor thieves break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Jesus counsels us when it comes to money because this is where our faith gets real. 
This is one of the biggest challenges for us to trust God and trust his wisdom. And God knows it. God knew it would be a challenge for us. In fact, if you read the Gospels of Matthew and Luke, you will be amazed at how often Jesus talks about the struggle we have with trusting him with money. It is prevalent in chapter after chapter after chapter. In fact, this might be the most difficult wisdom of God to apply to our lives. It's a challenge to trust God. Will we trust God to take care of our needs? So what does it mean to trust God with your money? Uh, I was writing this and this joke popped into my head that I'd heard years ago. So I'm going to tell it to you. I don't usually tell jokes, but, uh, but maybe this is inspired. I don't know. It's about pastors. There are three pastors getting together and trying to out-spiritual one another, as pastors are prone to do. And, um, and so they're talking about their generosity and how they figure out what to give to God. And so one says, well, here's what I do. I draw a circle on the ground. I uh, take my money. I throw it up in the air. And everything that lands in that circle, I give to God. The other pastor goes, well, I draw a bigger circle. And I throw my money up in the air. And everything that lands outside of it, I give to God. Third pastor says, you guys are both faithless. I don't have any of those stupid circles. I just stand there before God, I take my money, and I throw it up in the air, and whatever God wants, God keeps. <laughs> now, that is not the recommended way of trusting God with your money. You see, Jesus told us what it meant to trust God. He, he said, store up treasures in heaven, treasures that last. You know, we're, we're so good at trying to store up treasures on earth so that we can bless ourselves and enjoy those blessings. But he says, store up treasures in heaven. They're going to be there forever. They're going to carry over. The treasures here, you can't take it with you. The treasures in heaven are going to last for an eternity. So how do we store up treasures in heaven? We do that by investing in God's kingdom. We see it in pictures, pictures of, of uh, Barnabas. When, uh, as an early disciple, he went and sold a piece of property and he brought the proceeds to the disciples, the apostles, and he said, here, take this and bless people in the church. I want to build the kingdom. We, we see it in the Old Testament as God instructs his people to bring a tithe into the storehouse. He said, I want you to tithe. This is the way I'm going to support my people who are serving me. See, 12 tribes, 11 of them got land and one tribe got to serve God. They didn't get land. They didn't get property. They weren't farmers. They were servants of God. And so he said, the others, uh, I want you to bring in a tenth. One tenth of your uh, uh, produce, one tenth of your animals, one tenth of your income. And that's how God supported his work. That was one of the purposes of the tithe, 10%. The other purpose of the tithe, especially if you read the prophets, is for God's people to demonstrate their trust in God. It's a way to show God that we trust him to provide for our needs and take care of us. And so that's why tithing was given as proof that we are living a life of trust with our money. Now, most of us consider ourselves to be generous. I know this because if you have that conversation with people and you just ask them, are you generous? Almost everybody will tell you yes. Now we all admit, oh, I could be more generous, but I'm a generous person. In fact, I've yet to have a conversation with one single person who said, you know what? I am a stingy, cheapskate jerk. <laughs> now I've had lots of people tell me they knew a stingy, cheapskate <laughs> jerk. Maybe they were married to one. Maybe they're related to one. Maybe they're in business with one. But... I've never had anybody tell me they were one. You see, we kind of consider ourselves to be generous. We judge ourselves in a pretty, you know, kind light. But here's the, here's the issue. It doesn't matter whether we think we're generous or not. What matters is if God declares us generous or not. How do you know if God's going to declare you generous? Well, he gives us the tithe as a standard. If you don't know if you're generous, then do this. Look at your tax return. Look at your gross income. Divide it by 10. Take that number and compare it to your charitable contributions to Jesus. If the charitable contributions aren't at or above that number, I don't think God's going to call us generous. He's definitely not going to call us obedient. I recently heard a statistic that the average American church member gives 2.14% of their income to the church. 2.14%. Which means that the average American church member 
is not trusting God with their money. Which may explain why the average American church is dying. May explain why we're not having the, the impact on our culture that we have because we're living lives that say we don't trust God. You should trust Jesus to save you, but I don't trust God with my money. Now, I don't know where you are on that journey. I don't know where you are on that continuum. I don't know whether you give nothing to God or whether you are incredibly generous, way beyond 10%. But, uh, but you have to decide, will you trust God with your money? Will you trust him more than you're trusting him today? So will you trust God with your money? And finally, will you trust God for salvation? We trust God for salvation. John chapter 3, Jesus, again talking, says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him will not perish, but will have eternal life. We have forgiveness of sins. We have the promise of heaven. We have eternal life because Jesus died on the cross for us. Because God gave us his one and only Son. We are saved by grace alone. And yet I talk to so many people who, who say things like this. I'm trying to be a Christian. I'm working hard. I'm hoping to make it. And, and they say this. I, I'm afraid I'm not good enough. That's usually where I chime in and say, well, I agree with you. You're not good enough. None of us are good enough. The Bible says that. I love to affirm people's theology. And, and so when you say you're not good enough, guess what? The Bible agrees with you. There is no one righteous, not even one. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That's what Scripture affirms of us. None of us are good enough. None of us are qualified to get to heaven. That's why we need Jesus. Every single one of us in this room needs the grace and mercy that we get from trusting Jesus to save us. Every person that you meet out in uh, the community needs the, the message of Jesus to, to give them hope and life. That's how they're going to be forgiven. That's how they're going to attain heaven. That's how God makes it possible for us to be in with him forever as sons and daughters of God. It's by accepting the love and mercy of Jesus. It is not by trusting Jesus and being good. It's not by trusting Jesus and joining a church. It's not by trusting Jesus and serving or giving. It's just Jesus. He's the one who saves us. It is by his sacrifice and his love and all we can do is accept that love and mercy. And so today, some of you need to relax and rejoice in God's grace. You, you, you are so tired and you are so fearful that you're not going to make it. And I'm just telling you, if you've trusted Jesus, then, then his promises are good and you know that heaven is your destiny. Now, if you're sitting here and you have not experienced a life-changing relationship with the Son of God, then I don't want you to have peace. Because you shouldn't have peace. Because you need to go ahead and trust Jesus to be your Savior. And, and at the end of the service, there are going to be people of our, our prayer team right here at the front. You can talk to them. There are going to be pastors at the Connection Centers. You can talk to us. Or you can just simply bow your head right now and say, Jesus, I need you to save me. I need you to change my life. I can't do this on my own. I'm tired of trying. And he will give you life. That's his promise. But it all begins when we trust Jesus to save us. And we stop trying to validate God's love for us. We try, stop trying to earn God's love for us. And when we surrender and, and the grace and mercy of God washes over our souls, you know what happens? We are filled with such joy and gratitude that we want to serve God. That we want to show up in church and celebrate the life we have. That we want to give because of what God has given to us. It's all about the motivation that tells us who we're trusting for that salvation. So, will you trust God? He is good. And he is your father. And he wants us to trust him. He wants to direct our paths he has plans to bless us and to prosper us. Will you trust him? Let's pray.